Uh, my name is David Diarsa. I am the uh, current uh, president of the board uh, at CRUG, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you today and to uh, uh, buy you lunch thanks to our sponsors and, uh, and to put together a presentation that hopefully you'll enjoy. Uh, today we have a very, uh, uh, very exciting event in, in my mind, and uh, that is you've probably heard me talk a number of times about how my preference always is for presentations that uh, come from uh, end users and, and people uh, you know, in the BIM and Revit community as opposed to, say, uh, you know, a, a technical expert or somebody from Autodesk or, you know, there, there's great value in those presentations too, but I, something that's uh, near and dear to my heart is when one of you uh, gets up here and speaks, and that's exactly what's happening today. Mr. Chavez of uh, uh, CGF is going to uh, give us some of his wisdom, and I think that that is, uh, you know, he's putting his PowerPoint where his mouth is. He's an uh, always outspoken member, uh, always heckling uh, in a good way, the, uh, the wisdom up here on the podium. So today we get to hear from him, and I think that's fantastic. And on that note, I'd like to uh, uh, make sure that you all know, as, as members of CRUG and as attendees, that if you feel passionate about an issue and you've got information, you've got lessons learned, you've got things you want to impart to the group, uh, what Mark is doing today is available to you as well. Uh, you know, all you have to do is speak up and say, hey, I've got, I've got a topic I want to talk about, and we'll make it happen. We'll find a, we'll have somebody, uh, come in and, and help us with the sponsorship and get you up here. And speaking of, I would uh, uh, have as a great, uh, uh, great segue there to really thank Bluebeam for being, uh, uh, being the sponsor today and bringing us uh, Mark's presentation. Uh, I also want to give a quick shout out to last month's uh, sponsor, Pacific App, not just because I wasn't here when, uh, uh, when they presented uh, last month, but also because it was through Pacific App that I made the connection to Bluebeam and they made it uh, possible for Bluebeam to be here today. So thank you very much. Uh, that was great. A uh, couple of uh, little housekeeping items. Uh, you know, uh, big thanks also to the rest of our sponsors. Uh, you know, it's, it's how this happens. Membership is free to you. Lunch is free to you. And that all happens because we've got great sponsors that believe in our costs and, and want to get uh, you know, their services, their products in front of you, and more importantly, feel excited and, and uh, uh, I feel passionate about our BIM community and maintaining it as vibrant as it is. One quick uh, thing that you might uh, notice if you're particularly observant up there, we have uh, actually uh, uh, gone back down to three executive partners. Imagine it uh, has decided to, uh, to take a premier role uh, as opposed to an executive role, and so we're, we're sorry to see that participation diminish, but at the same time we are very thankful to imagine it for uh, all the years that they have been behind us. And, uh, they continue to do so, just in a little bit different uh, capacity. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much to all the sponsors. We really, really appreciate it. And a quick shout out just to the board members. Uh, you know, you know who you are. Don't have to embarrass you by making you stand up and do a little dance. Uh, but thank you. Uh, it's uh, and if you see them, thank them. These are the folks that get together and, and really make these uh, presentations happen and kind of uh, give a little bit of direction to this group. I think over the years we've gotten relatively uh, uh, consistent at what we do and, and every once in a while we try to mix it up a little bit and today's presentation is evidence of that but uh, this is the group of people that uh, get together and try to, try to dream up what, uh, uh, what you might enjoy and how uh, uh, we will go about it. So thank you. A uh, little quick uh, event uh, announcement coming up. Uh, BIM Forum is happening next uh, month in uh, Minneapolis, and if you ever wanted to go to Minneapolis, uh, April is not a bad time to do it. It's, you know, after it's frigid and before it gets too hot and full of mosquitoes, so it's perfect time. And the BIM Forum is a really great event, so if you haven't uh, looked into it, uh, it's not really just for contractors, even though it's put on by the AGC. There's uh, more and more designers and engineers that are participating in the BIM Forum, and it's a really great event. Make sure that's still up there. Uh, and then we have a couple of uh, employment announcements. This was up there last month, and uh, I believe that it's still active. Uh, Cushing Terrell is looking for a couple of people, and so that information is up there and will be on the, uh, on the website if you're interested. And I have a new one from Sequoia Electric. Uh, they're looking for a couple of detailers uh, to help them with their, uh, their shop drawings and shop models. So uh, there's the information. I'll leave it up for a couple of seconds if you want to jot it down, if you're interested at all, or if you know somebody that might be. 
uh, looking for employment in that arena. And uh, I always try to remind people before you uh, try to rush out when Mark's going along, uh, make sure if you stick around to the end, we have a, a drawing. I've got uh, people who are SVP'd, their names are in this envelope, and we'll have Mark pull a, pull a couple of names. And I have uh, $25 gift cards from Amazon to uh, give out. So with that, I'm going to get off the podium, and I'm going to uh, ask Nick Decker from Bluebeam to come up. And he's got a few slides. Uh, he's going to talk about Bluebeam a little bit, and then we'll, uh, we'll turn it over to Mark. And uh, just uh, as a Bluebeam uh, user, just uh, this is, if you are not familiar with the product, I think it's, it's one of our uh, uh, best tools in the toolkit uh, for myself and my team personally. So I think that uh, I'm excited to have Bluebeam as part of the CROG family. And thank you, Nick, very much. Let me uh, put up your. Uh, Leave. That you are somewhere in here. There you go. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Thanks everyone for uh, uh, having me out here. Uh, just wanted to kind of do a quick little introduction. If you're not familiar with Bluebeam, uh, essentially it's a PDF software kind of purpose built for the AEC world. So um, I'm again. I'm Nick Decker. I'm a senior industry senior industry specialist with uh, Bluebeam. I'm out of our Chicago office, but uh, we've got a couple other offices uh, nationwide as well. So uh, I, I kind of mentioned it, it's a PDF software. It's, PDF is not sexy or cool, uh, but it's a fantastic platform for everyone on the, uh, throughout the project lifecycle to be able to communicate. Uh, ISO standard file format where everyone can kind of go and collaborate and uh, Use, utilize published documents as, as you all do for uh, a, a number of different workflows and allowing, to, uh, allowing you to kind of leverage that workflow, or excuse me, that file format through the entire project life cycle is very useful. Now, uh, 2016, uh, we just released our, our latest uh, version of the software and there's some really neat enhancements that I think uh, would be quite pertinent, especially for a Revit user group. Uh, because we do ha specifically have some uh, Revit enhancements as well. Now, there's a couple others on the list that I'll touch on, uh, but I want to show specifically the uh, Revit one here. Now, uh, let me go full screen and go ahead and press play. Uh, essentially, within Revit, there's a Bluebeam specific plugin. And so, just like any other plugin into Revit, uh, it lives within the add ins menu. Uh, and that's been there for several years now. Uh, am I playing? Sorry. All right, so it, it's been there uh, kind of in the, the top ribbon at, um, under add-ins, and you've been able to always create 2D PDFs out of it. Now, uh, there were some enhancements this year where if you utilize rooms, you're actually able to export those rooms into spaces within PDF file format. Uh, you're also able to export area measurements directly from those rooms. So whatever corners and areas and walls you define within those, those rooms within Revit, can immediately be pulled over essentially kind of as a layer within the, the PDF file format and basically allow you to do all of your, uh, your area measurements as well as kind of define, uh, for example, uh, the punch list workflow, be able to define where each one of those punch keys or, or whatever it is that you're doing uh, in PDF file format and have that list populate. So you'll see here on the left-hand side that list is basically populated off of the rooms that were defined within Revit. So, uh, not only the room name, but the room number. Uh, and as, uh, as you place markups within each one of those, it will kind of subcategorize those and allow you to uh, leverage that, that information. So um, just a, a quick overview. I will be afterward, or around afterwards to uh, show any of this if anyone is interested. So um, beyond that, as far as new features, uh, we have what's called legends. Basically, it allows you to capture um, and organize all the information they're placed on the page, whether it be punch keys, uh, if you're walking around doing punch lists and have to kind of assign statuses and things like that. It's a way to organize that, uh, that data at, on a table format on the PDF itself. So it's gonna dynamically update, uh, and you can kind of see at a glance that, for example, uh, I've got you know, this many ceiling issues, this many that are rejected, accepted, uh, or haven't been assigned a status at that point. Beyond that, um, and, and this is a very data-heavy um, uh, release for us, uh, being able to kind of harness all that information that you're placing on the page, again, throughout the entire project lifecycle. 
Uh, batch markup summary is the ability to kind of customize and harness all that data across your entire uh, file set. So it's not just one drawing at a time and I have to run a report for each one of these, uh, these file sets. It's I can run all of these reports, organize it dependent on the information that I'm putting in, on the page, uh, and then create sub-reports and things like that if I need to be able to uh, communicate certain items to certain individuals or whatever else it may be. Again, you're welcome to stick around and I can show uh, each of these afterwards. Uh, tags and drawing logs is a neat one, uh, my personal favorite, uh, because a lot of times you're placing information on the title block or within the drawing itself uh, that's content of the page. And there's no way to really harness that or leverage that uh, within the PDF file format until now where you can basically uh, define regions within the drawing and say that, hey, this is my, uh, my sheet number or my sheet name uh, and literally pull that into a table format, uh, be able to create updated drawing logs on a day-to-day -day basis as you're creating different releases, different RFIs, things like that, and start, again, harnessing that data um, in, in basically a, a live database within your file set. So we've got a whole bunch of other uh, enhancements. Uh, you'll see the list down here, as well as the and more aspect. Um, but uh, sh short questions, if anyone has anything, but I'd really like to uh, bring it back to Mark at this point. Again, I'm going to stick around afterwards if anyone has questions. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, so like I said, a really great uh, part of the uh, toolkit. It's actually, uh, we've, we've made it part of our standard IT offering to, all, to everybody at uh, VM Builder. So without any further ado, Mark, here's the clicker. Great, thank you. Here's your presentation. Okay, I should, be, I should be on, so hopefully you're hearing me over this microphone. So to start with, I want you to know that I wore black today on purpose. As an architect, I have to. It's, you get it when you get your stamp. I left the sports coat, the squash blossom necklace at home, and I'm not drinking a Cosmo, but I wanted to. <clears throat> and under the humor category, I will start with a short reading, which I think is important by Jody Brown. If you're not familiar with Jody Brown's um, website, uh, which is Coffee with an Architect, you should be. But it's a short disclaimer about architecture. Take only as directed by a design professional. Do not exceed recommended dosage. Take architecture with water, preferably a reflecting pond. Keep architecture out of the reach of children and city planning commissions. Actual architecture may vary. Do not use architecture if you have ever had a severe allergic reaction to design or engineering. Do not take architecture if you are currently using an interior designer or plan to use an interior designer in the future. Discontinue use if you have had thoughts of suicide or delusions of grandeur. Do not operate heavy machinery while under the influence of architecture. Leave that to the contractors. Architecture may induce nausea. This will pass. Other side effects may include swelling of the ego, ennui, darkening of the clothing, it happens to all of us, rectilinear forms, difficulty sleeping, trouble communicating with the public, arm waving, circular glasses, inability to afford your own taste, and a heightened sense, heightened tolerance for caffeine. Do not take architecture if you are not currently being paid for architecture. Architecture may not lead to recognition or awards. The maker of art, makers of architecture do not assume any responsibility for the architecture of other architects. No guarantee of appropriateness is either implied or recommended. Please allow adequate time for the architecture to take effect. Actual size of architecture may vary. Contact a lawyer immediately if swelling of the architectural ego lasts for more than four hours. Verify architecture in the field, void where prohibited. Okay, now that I've given you the disclaimer, well, don't clap for me, you should clap for Jody Brown, who actually is kind of a very inventive fellow. Um, I'm not gonna stand there all the time, <clears throat> but I will flip this thing back and forth on occasion. Um, I wanted to talk about the process of architecture, and I don't want to use the word paradigm because it's been so overly used that the definition gets a bit bizarre. But like I said here, you want to finish the job with uh, paradigms to run together, and hopefully it will click, forward, click. So this just, I was putting a presentation together last week, and this showed up, a big job got stopped. Um, you know, 1.2 million square feet of, of job is not happening at the moment. Um, 
and it might start up again. It could have stopped for this reason, that reason. I don't know what the reasons were. But bad things happen to big jobs. Bad things happen to this job. The uh, pharaoh died. Um, they have not set a restart date yet. So what we want to do is <clears throat> we all want smoother running projects at a lowered risk for the owner, the contractor, and the architect. Um, so hopefully this means that you get to keep more of your fee, and as a result, not only are we going to end up with more money at home, but the owner's going to end up with a better building at a better price and be able to build more, which we would all like to see happen. So how did we get here? Well, here's the old days. Pretty traditional owner-architect relationship defined by AIA's A201 with the third-party obligations at the bottom, which is the information transfer and managing the documentation of the job being done by the architect um, for the owner. And this works great if, roughly speaking, 100 years ago, the contractor knew the most about building things. The architect really was in pretty much control of all of the materials that they were building with. They understood them all. They hadn't changed a lot. A little tidbit, between the first version of Ramsey and Sleeper's uh, book on uh, drafting standards, graphic standards, and the second edition of their book, they had to reorganize the book and expand it because the number of products that had happened between 1926 and 1932, I think I've got my dates close, was so huge they had to reorganize what they were doing because projects, products were expanding greatly. This relationship has been modified now to that relationship. I have a huge pile of consultants, specialists who really understand what they do. The general contractor, and I'm going to stop calling the contractor contractor for a reason, has a whole bunch of subconsultants and people that they use. One of the things that was impressed upon me as a young undergrad, one of my major professors, Ruth Ann Knudsen, said, Mark, you have to watch language. And calling women lady or honey or whatever simply wasn't going to cut it. A, it wasn't professional. And B, in some ways, it might not put them at the same level you were at. Maybe they were less than you were or some other potentially cultural, cultural distinction was being made. And if I think about construction nowadays, I have a contract with the owner, and the contractor has a contract with the owner. So what's the difference between me and the contractor? We're both contractors. And the difference, maybe, was that 100 years ago, we were seen as the professionals. We do have stamps um, that were managing the process. And the contractor was simply building what we told them to build. Well, nowadays, I would argue that contractors or constructors are certainly as professional as anything we're doing. They have a contractor's license. We have an architect's license. I won't get into the difference between life safety stuff and all the L&I and the other things that the constructors are dealing with. And I may say the word contractor in the presentation, but I'm trying to change my brain because we're both team members trying to get something done at the same time, and we both have contracts. So we're either all contractors or we're all professionals of one variety or another. But we have a lot of people involved in the process nowadays. This is my copy of the 1927 Uniform Building Code. It's you know, a little pocketbook, half an inch thick. This is now a slightly out of date slide showing just three of my 16 volumes of NFPA documents. I don't reference all of them every day. My building code's down at the bottom in blue. Then uh, the old ASCE 7. There's my ASTMs and UL tests that go in the building code. The spiral bind is my SMACNA details. There's my old version of the concrete manual. How many of you guys know the color of the new one? Field guide? New concrete field guide? Oh, you guys. I'm the only person in this entire room that has a concrete field guide. OK, if you're an architect and you don't care about concrete, you still want to get a copy of the field guide. The new color is purple, by the way, not red. But my I cry manuals for concrete, the Concrete Restoration Institute, a book on construction tolerances, which is something we can talk about with Revit. Why can't Revit be fuzzy? You think slab edges are, right? No, they're not. Slab edges are me on a Friday night in Ballard. You know, we're wandering a little bit. But yet, you know, Revit is like, we're done. <laughs> it's like, no, it's fuzzy. And precast concrete, great stuff. We have good companies now. We have great concrete in this town. 
it's not that square. On a good day, it's not that square. And steel erection, like, come on. The book says there's tolerances involved in steel erection, and that's still good steel being hung correctly, but it's not square. Anyway, tolerance is important. So this is Adler and Sullivan. Eight, we could probably sit here, and in 20 minutes, we could name every single material in that entire building, including the interior finishes, and all the electrical and mechanical systems, not the, but the materials in the systems, or the motors. We could, we could make a definitive list. The, seeds, uh, the central television building in China, you know, a lot of new materials going on. This is a little graph I made a couple of years ago now, so it's out of date as it is. I took just a couple of companies, Fortifiber, Carlisle, DuPont, yeah. And I talked to the Fortifiber guys. They invented a new product in 1951. So instead of number 15 felt that you'd put on the outside of the building, they had a building paper. And in that, there were now two products you could put on the outside of a building. I built this. I went to forspecs.com, and I counted air barrier, weather-resistive barrier products. Not when you take gyps sheathing and you tape the joints, or blue board and you tape the joints. Just products that are made to cover the entire wall and call themselves a weather-resistant barrier or an air barrier. There were 130 products from 70 companies. And this is two years ago, and since then I've had chats from a couple of different product reps with more products. This is a very crude little graph, but it looks an awful lot like that one which is a graph of a natural log, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, et cetera, et cetera. Products are blossoming huge. And as you can see, it says, it, you know, what, it, what I didn't include in that count of products. So products have gone a lot. So what are the problems? I guess so we can look at that screen, too. So is it just me? Am I just making this stuff up? Or have a bunch of other people been talking about it? So I went digging around a little bit. And the graph that was included in the promo for this presentation is Dr. Thielholz's graph. And <clears throat> I'm going to have to lean a little bit here so I can do a little reading, although I tried ne never to read the slides. Here are some people, some selected studies or people, who have talked about some of the potential problems we have in our industry. Dr. Thielholz's um, Index of Construction Labor, the con uh, Construction Users Roundtable, or CURT, the book Broken Buildings, Bust of Budgets, which is very good, but I have some issues with his conclusions, by Mr. LePatner, but it is a very good summary of all this. A short article on what you are worth by Scott Simpson last year in Design Intelligence. And then the um, Integrated Project Delivery Guide for that the AIA California chapter uh, did. Here's Mr. Thielholz's graph. The first one of these came out in 1996, and it was fine. And a lot of people said, well, come on. That's not really real. Um, how do you justify those numbers? And the, labor, the Department of Labor does not generate a non-farm non-manufacturing labor productivity number. They don't. They have non-farm manufacturing, and construction isn't there, which is part of the problem. We don't collect data. So this, and the article is, there's the link to the article, which is now offline. You've got to pay a buck for it. Or find me, and I, I'll send you a copy that I've got. But on AAC Bytes, and all the different colored lines are the different measures, the different indexes he used to construct his number. The short version of his number, oh, it's not on there. It's too bad. The short version of his number is that manufacturing productivity has gone up roughly 3% a year since 19, where is it on? 1964. I was eight. We have a lot of data in productivity. Construction productivity, as far as Mr. Chilwitz is concerned, has gone down point three eight percent a year since 1964. So it's 50-odd years of data, and we're not going up. So I think we have a trend happening here. Now, he says, we do, it's because we do unique work. We're not, building a, we're not building widgets that come out of a factory. We're not even bu building Boeing airplanes that are very expensive. But once you've got one down, they just keep rolling them out. Um, he also says that we have a, com a procurement system based on com competition versus collaboration. I agree with that. Poor use of data, absolutely. Um, the declining real labor prices I'm not going to get into, but I wanted to list it because he had done that. We do indeed have many small firms performing a significant percentage of the work, 
and we do an awful lot of remodel renovation work. So his solutions, okay, better use of data with building information modeling and, and IPD, okay, greater use of that manufacturing database to do more modular and off-site work, because they're more efficient at it, let's do it in the factory and bring it out. And a lot of the big, big firms will do big um, constructing subs, do do work off-site and bring it forward. You know, duct work comes in from off-site. Uh, Walters and Wolf, you know, wants to do, loves to do unitized curtain well. They'll do it up in their, in their facility in a controlled environment with the sealant coming out of a gun connected to a thing and an air, you know, it's all very slick and works great. Um, so he suggests that we do those two things, an improved business model that supports the owner's life cycle. The cost of life cycle in a building to the construction of the building, that includes my fees, his fees, and the actual construction of the thing, it's one to 10. They're different, one to eight, one to 10, I see different numbers around. But the life of a building in maintenance, upkeep, and I'm not even sure that one to 10 includes the wages of the people that are living in the building, isn't included. And yet that price is not part of the equation when it comes to building the building. Really? Okay. The Canadians, these folks, have, they don't quite agree with Mr. Thielholtz. They think actually there has been some modest increases in productivity based on a thing called chained dollars. You know, we all take dollars inflate, and then we balance the, we take the inflation back out, and we get balanced dollars now to 1964. You know, and you've, I think most of you have seen that kind of thing. Real dollars. They have a different way of calculating that, and I'm not enough of an economist to even pretend to define it to you. But they say if you use chain dollars, you have a slightly positive uh, productivity increase in construction, which I would hope, because we've all been trying very hard since I got out of school in 87 using AutoCAD version 2.15. And you guys remember AutoCAD without an undo button? In one point, what was it, 1 1.4, 1 1.5, no undo button, no mouse support, and the first mice had these steel balls, right, in the green color, from, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, they have, they say that we've actually been increasing a little bit, but they can have the same solutions, though. Okay. I get torn between talking too fast, which is something I naturally do, and rushing slides for you guys, but I don't want to get too deep into the weeds because there's lots of other fun things to talk about. Um, so the Kurt folks came up with this report in 2004, and this was, I am told, but I do not have a fact for it, the basis for the integrated project delivery thing that the California Council AIA came up with in 2007 was this report in 2004. Big problems, owners are getting the bad side of this deal because they're not engaged. So they've said, here's the problems. Owners regularly experience schedule and cost overruns. The difficulties are artifacts in the construction process brought by lack of cooperation. Heard that before? Owners delegate responsibility for organizing and driving project to other parties and have not been assertive. So they're saying, get the owners back involved, make us work together, and basically use some kind of model to help us do that. Okay, more of that pause. Now, so maybe I'll stop here, and we'll stop on Mr. LePatton for just a second. So I think I've kind of made the point that there are issues, not just me, but there are issues in this business. People have been talking about this for a while. Mr. LePatner did it, is a very nice book he, called Broken Buildings, Busted Budgets. He brings up a lot of really good problems with the industry. One of them is asymmetric information, which, just hold on to that for a second. Mutable costs, his, he, he's an attorney, a construction attorney. He really wants the budget to get nailed down. If, if there is no incentive for change orders, if you get paid for whatever it costs you to build it, then you're not putting a little contingency in the back pocket, you're not chasing every RFI with cash behind it, it's just a problem to fix, not I can make some money on this deal. So that's his mutable costs. He wants those gone. I'm not sure that can happen. Small fragmented firms, we've heard that before, and a dearth of education, research development, techno and technology utilization. He wrote this book in 2007, so Revit was just really starting to get fluffy and start working in 2007. But he really sees it as not having dug in much. So let's stop for a minute and talk about asymmetric informa information. 
So asymmetry we know about, something not the same, and information we know about, so we think we got it, <coughs> asymmetric information. Well, Mr. Akerlof won his Nobel Prize for this. Mr. Akerlof, by the way, is the husband of our current Fed chair, uh, Janet Yellen, right? <coughs> anyway, two bad things can happen to you with asymmetric information. He uses used cars as his example. Um, let's use contracting and architecting um, as our examples. So the first one is <coughs> Adverse selection sounds very important. Adverse selection is picking the wrong people. Architects, we usually pick our engineers because they have good qualifications. They, they're respected in the business. That's a good way to pick somebody, that you know of their rep, you know of their experience. But likewise, architects, the contractor says, well, you can't afford that. Well, okay, we don't have any number to compare what the contractor has told us that we've drawn that we can't afford, so we might end up making bad choices. Contractors or constructors, how many of you guys have hired your subs on low bid? Right? I mean, even if it's a GCCM or design build project, right? MPE, fire or F, curtain wall, you bring them in. Big contractors. Flooring sub, get them down. Really? Is that the best way to choose your subs on lowest price? Meaning the person who has screwed up the most on their bid and you make sure they're responsible, they got it close. The person who has screwed it on their bid enough not to be irresponsible, or not enough to be irresponsible, but enough to be low, they're the ones you hire for the job. You think you might be doing adverse selection there? Owners, same thing. I, like, I pick on everybody. Owners, you hired an architect because they had cute pictures in the AIA magazine? R really? Are they on time, on budget? Do they have any data at all about their productivity, about how good a job they do, how many RFIs they had on the last job? Um, do they have big problems? Not that they got sued, but did they get things done? You have no idea. You could be selecting an architect just because. And that's not necessarily a wise thing to do. You should get some information about them beyond the pretty picture you saw in the magazine. Okay. So that's adverse selection. Moral hazard is pretty easy to turn that one into getting taken for a ride. You know, you hire a contractor to remodel your, to remodel your bathroom. And the contractor comes to you and says, well, we're going to take the whole south side off your house. Why? Well, we have to because, you know, the XYZ is connected to the shin bone, connected to the thigh bone, connected to the ankle. And if you do that, you have to take the toilet out. and take the toilet out, you have to take the south wall of the house out. And you're like, that doesn't seem right, but I don't know anything about contracting, and they're already on board, and they've got the bathroom all torn up. I can't just fire them, because then I, what do I do with this? And th I'm a homeowner. There's no bond thing going on. I mean, I, uh, okay, uh, how much more will that cost, right? Moral hazard is a problem. It's a big problem, even in GCCM jobs and design build jobs. <clears throat> once the contract has been signed, and God forbid, once somebody has mobilized, that owner is stuck with that contractor bonding aside. You're done. That, the constructor had better have the owner's interests first in their mind, or bad things can happen. And if the next job, next job, they're going to get the next job because they bid low, what's the business use of keeping the owner's interests first? Because you're not going to get repeat business out of it. You have to keep your interests first, because we all have to get something to go home with at the end of the week. Okay. So here are his solutions. <clears throat> the ones in red I disagree with. He basically says, have all of us work for GM construction and Ford construction, you know, great big companies, because they can consolidate lots of little firms, do soup to nuts, get it all organized, be really efficient. Okay, I'm not sure I want to work for Ford dot construction. Um, also, he wants architects to do 100% drawings. Well, it's kind of like that thing, I never took calculus because I'm an architect and I don't have to. 
but you know, they talk about half the distance to the end, and then half the distance to the end, and then half the distance to the end, and you get to the point that you never get to the end because you're always having the distance. 100% drawings is kind of like that. I think most of you folks probably get that one. <coughs> he also talks about no change orders. Now, I put this in red because I think it made me crazy. But what he's trying to do again is you're going to get paid for all your costs. Find a weird thing in the ground, you're going to get paid for it. Architect's detail was screwed up, you're going to get paid for it. Architect, your detail was screwed up, I understand your drawings are not going to be perfect 100% because nobody is perfect. Therefore, there will be mistakes in your drawings. You will get paid for fixing them. Everybody will get paid to get the job done. But your profit is a different story. But again, if, you, if every single money item is paid for, then you can lock it down. The building is going to be this much money. We're going to make it happen. And the only change orders that are going to add money are owner, are owner requests. And again, he also says no R&D. Design build is a good idea with a good intermediary. We didn't talk about intermediaries, which I should. So before I talk about worth, let's talk about intermediaries. Akerlof's asymmetric information was solved, the problem with it, because it's a good thing. It's why I have a job. It's why all of you folks have a job. You know more about what you know about than anybody else in your shop. It's asymmetric information. It keeps you from getting fired. I mean, they'd love to. God, can't we get rid of that guy? No, no, he has too much spec stuff in his head. We've got to hang on to him. Do we have to? Yes, you do. So asymmetric information is good. We like asymmetric information. But if it's too great, we have this problem, right? The adverse selection and um, moral hazard. So used cars, which is what Mr. Akerlof's thing was about. If, okay, if there are two kinds of used cars in the market, there are really bad used cars, will barely run, and there are really good used cars. If they're all just sitting on a lot, and the people who want to sell them can put prices on them, they're used cars. I wanted the cheap one, and I go get it, I pay for it, and it falls apart. And that one's too expensive, but here's another cheap one. I'll go, and pretty soon, the market falls apart. The market can't work. Because I don't know anything about used cars. Right? I'm the person with the construction project in the south wall of the house. I don't know about used cars. All I know is price. Maybe the one in the middle is OK. I pick one in the middle, and I wander off with that one. If there's a used car salesman, it's hard, hard to think of used car salesman in a positive light. If there's a used car salesman, and they are a, a valid, useful person, and they're doing a good job for you, they're going to ask you some questions. What's your budget? What kind of used car do you want? I just need to get down the street. Then it's like, OK, 200 bucks, sold. You will get down the street. We don't know how long it's going to go, but it is four tires, and you can go. No, I, I need a, a used something that's going to last for another five, 10 years. You know, Some mileage is OK. I know it's not new. We've got some used Volvos over here. You know, They cost 17,000 and not 200. But from quizzing you and talking about it, we can go there, and you're going to enjoy that car for a long time. Yes, it is used, and the warranty and guarantees that go along with that. But having a good intermediary helps the asymmetric inf information relationship. OK, so do I want to say anything else about asymmetric information? No, I'll save that for the, ask, for the, for the last. So what is value? If price is what you agree to pay for it, the $200 for the used car, minus the cost of what it costs to produce it or provide it, the difference is the value. Well, we, his quote here, the AEC industry has been relatively ineffective in articulating the basic value proposition that is inherent to the construction of buildings. So here's some little factoids about the construction of buildings. Pretty much everybody, except our large homeless population in Seattle, lives in one. And when they get up and leave for the office, they work in one. Sometimes they work in ones that aren't constructed yet. But they work in one. So we spend all this time in buildings, and yet owners, I think that's the next slide up, owners see building as kind of a sunk cost. Oh, I've got to get the thing built before I can actually start doing something. This huge built environment, and we're not, it's not seen as valuable. 
And the short version is we should start thinking about that long-term life cycle cost um, when we're talking about the value of the building. Now, it's never going to even out. A Major League Baseball player gets paid more money in, I think, about two games than I make in my entire lifetime. So my value, Major League Baseball players' value, you know, well, they get, there's some entertainment value in them, they get to wear funny facial hair, you know, there's more things going on with those guys than me, so maybe they do have a higher value, but really, my entire life's earnings versus, you know, two, two what, four at-bats and two games. But there's, so we want to deal with that. Okay, and again, no data. We don't collect data. We don't deal with data. We don't do things. Okay, so summing up, I think I beat this horse to death. Here are a big stack of problems. I kind of pulled them all from the, the other slide, from the other slides. And here's a bunch of solutions. Be cooperative, use BIM. Um, Use design build, offsite fabrication, more data, my personal favorite. Okay, that paradigm thing. Thomas Kuhn wrote this book in 1962 called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, and I forgot to bring my copy with me. You should read this book. First of all, it's a very readable book, one. Two, it gives you a plug into a lot of these early scientists doing things which are kind of fun and it examines how science changed. He was doing a course in, he was teaching a course in history of science, and if you go back and look at, at history texts, or even people writing about their discoveries at the end of it, it appears that science was this constant march into the future. And it hasn't been that way at all. Um, and I thought, since I'm not that smart, how can I fix the construction industry? Because I'm gonna fix it because as an architect, I know that I can. Um, how can I personally, Mark Chavez, fix the construction industry? Well, I'm not that smart, so I'm gonna go to other places and see how they have dealt with change. And the science folks, I mean, science, it may not be the be all end all, but it sure as heck is a way to solve a whole lot of problems. You break them down, reductionist science, right? You break them down until you get just one variable, you study the heck out of it, right? and it comes up with the same results every time. It's like, I got that one nailed. Now let's go do the next variable, and the next variable, the next variable, and you build it up, and pretty soon you can say, gravity works. And we, but we had to do studies first before we could say that. Okay, so this is, the, this is the third edition of this book. I have the second edition of this book. So I pulled a little bit out of Wikipedia to just to paraphrase him up. So here's the first part of his structure of scientific revolutions. Phase one, pretty much everybody does what they want to do. There is no method, there is no specific agreed upon way that you do science. Or every time I say science, insert the word construction. So back here, the primitive hut, right? So there's a round lady pointing at the chubby little baby saying, that's what I want. That would either be, that's a putti, the little short guy with the wings. So either a cerebim or a chera, cherubim or a seraphim. I'm not sure which one, but putti nonetheless. That's architecture history. I aced that class. Not so good in design, but by God, history. Had that one down. So that, there we go. There is no method. The king says there's a method, or somebody starts to agree on something. A way to do construction or a way to do science. Phase two, things go along fine. We're doing science, we're studying stuff, we're gathering, reducing down to one variable, solving the problems, moving on. And in construction, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So the Photoshop version of uh, Zaha Hadid's building looks really cool. This is an actual photograph from the facility. Doesn't look so cool. But again, the crisis was averted because Photoshop was available. Um, and, there was, and there was a 30-year-old or younger in the room that could do Photoshop. You could get down on Photoshop, and so the building looks great. But again, the crisis has, the, the system, the way we do things has problems. 
And so you can usually solve them. Not every problem runs into a crisis. It's like, that's difficult, we find a way of doing it. Well, we have. We, we did a couple things. Um, life was fine, World War II happened, World War II is over, a lot of people had babies, like um, I'm a late one, I'm 56, but started having babies and they needed more buildings. So we started coming up with new ways of building buildings. Fast track scheduling, right? Everybody's on the fast track scheduling. Stack, which is now standard procedures. Well, when I started in architecture in 1987, fast track was this thing was done sometimes. And now it's pretty much, when you all agree, the thing that we do all the time. The foundation package goes out and we keep drawing on the next, next bit and the next bit and the next bit. Um, Around about 1960, around about 1960, a boiler blew up in Louisiana, I believe. The mechanical contractor or subcontractor had put the sensor in backwards and it had frozen up and had blown up the boiler. Blamed the architect, because the architect was supposed to be providing supervision of the work, because that's what it said in the AIA's A201. And they sued. Now, eventually, the court found that no, the architect was not responsible for the day-to-day -day supervision of the mechanical contractor's people. But between starting that case and finishing that case, the AI yanked supervision from the general conditions. Because it's scary and we don't like risk. Nobody likes risk. Around about 1970, the AIA yanked, stopped the work. So we no longer stop the work. We go to the owner and we go, <laughs> That nasty mean contractor is doing terrible things to your building, and you just have to stop them from doing it right now. And this usually has a great effect upon the owner. First, it makes them nauseous. Second, they ask you to leave the room, which is why I'm never invited to those meetings. But then they, they, they may indeed stop the work. This is the next phase. I love Levius Woods. He had some cool stuff, all pencil drawings, a lot of fun. This might be hard to build. So at some point, these crises they get to a point where you can't solve them anymore. You can't fix it. No matter how many times you try to solve the problem, you don't quite get there. Does that kind of sound like construction today? You know, we try construction management. I was doing the AIA thing, but you know, in that same period of time, 1960 till now, um, we came up with construction management. AIA hated construction management. So construction management as an agent, where they're essentially a super employee for the owner. They're not building things. Construction manager as constructor or contractor, where they have some crews in the field. Separate um, GCCM or CMGC, if you're not in Washington State. Design build. All these things have come up in the past 50 years to try to fix the problem. Because we have a crisis. The industry has recognized we have a crisis because we keep on trying to solve it with these different methods. Hasn't worked. The latest one, integrated project delivery. Uh, not really. Okay. So. If you haven't seen this movie, you really should. Here's our young hero, Gary Cooper. Good looking, man. We're gonna make this building, we're gonna get rid of all this old crap, we're gonna strip it off, right? And it's gonna look great. He's got the new paradigm, right? He's figured out a new way of doing things that's gonna solve the problems, which is great. And then last but not least, <sighs> revolution over, crisis averted, we all go back to doing regular science or construction again. We found a way over those humps and it works. Okay, so what's next? I'm gonna leave that slide up, but I'm gonna talk about um, Ptolemaic astronomy for just a second. The Ptolemies were that crew that pretty much ran Egypt for a long time, they came from Greece, but Ptolemaic and then Ptolemy as a person. Ptolemaic astronomy worked great. I mean, it was really good. You could figure out where the sun and the moon and the stars were all going and you could predict the dates and you do the formula and it would work pretty close. Close enough for seafaring folks to do an awful lot of work in that thing, but it didn't quite work. We got to Copernicus and it just didn't work. And it just didn't work. And they finally figured out the solutions to his problems was that it wasn't a geocentric deal, it was a heliocentric deal. Um, and so we got rid of his paradigm and we adopted a new paradigm. But one of the things about paradigms is the old stuff still has to be accounted for. And if we're doing sun sightings or star sightings on a boat, you're still using Ptolemaic 
astronomy. You know, we don't have errors in the numbers because we have Copernican astronomy to cook the books, but we're still using Ptolemy's work to figure out where we are in a boat out on the ocean. So it's not that it didn't work, but the model hit a crisis. They couldn't explain these little errors. And they, every time they would add a factor to take care of these errors, there'd be more errors. So they could never quite get it. OK. So I don't want to be labor um, solutions to crisis. I think we're somewhere between two and three. Um, I don't think we may not have hit the final crisis. We might still be in a method of fixing stuff. But we really are going to get to the point where we have got to figure out how to do the new paradigm um, or the new way of doing things. I almost hate to use the word paradigm because it just doesn't mean much anymore. So integrated project delivery, I have about five slides on this, but I'm going to go pretty quick because I'm not sure it really solves the problem, but it should. So here's what it says it does. This is their definition. It should integrate people. OK, they talk about collaboration as an error. Um, should reduce waste and optimize efficiency, that'd be good. Um, it should happen through all phases of design. That's great. A continuous involvement of the owner, that takes care of the Kurt people. Business interests align through shared risk reward, that takes care of some of the Patner stuff I didn't talk about. He talks about this allocated risk contracts, which spins off into law and economics, mostly law, which is not what I have a degree in. I sleep with a lawyer, but that doesn't mean I know anything about it. Um, the uh, project controlled by the owner and key designers and builders, okay. Uh, Multi-party agreements that takes care of the risk stuff better. And limited liability, again, taking care of the risk stuff. Now this was in the new version of their book. These, now you've optimized it if you do the following. Separate profit from cost, I mentioned that a little earlier, so I won't get back into that again. Guaranteeing the cost to perform the work, we talked about that a second ago. Um, Profit again, limit, limit entitlement to change orders to the owner, we talked about that. Involvement of key parties, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Joint project control and decision making, this all works great, it sounds wonderful. Here's a little picture, which I'm not gonna talk about. This is from their new um, thing about telling us, basically, you know, the whole point, it's about the building, it's about the whole thing, it's not about your individual little bits and pieces. But I'm gonna blow past this one. Okay, so what worked? Uh, in 2012, 2013, a guy wrote Jonathan Cohen, went to talk to a bunch of people who had done integrated project delivery and came up with this study about things that worked. Now, I don't know, but the AIA published it. So he probably didn't find every little piece of dirty laundry concerning integrated project delivery. Perhaps he did, and I'm just being prejudicial, but I don't think so. But this is what worked. Early involvement of key participants did work. Shared risk reward did work. Here's a whole list of things that, that worked pretty well. More things that worked pretty well. Getting people in a big room, having everybody work together. Transparent financials, having the books open. The no claim thing. Everybody know what subrogation is? Yeah, that's subrogation. If you don't know what subrogation is, you should find out. But subrogation is basically why your insurance company works for you. You have a car accident, right? You get your car fixed, you just go home. The insurance company goes to court and stands in your place and says, we have been damaged. This car has been damaged. Mr. or Ms. Judge, I want you to fix it by finding that party guilty and giving us the money. That is subrogation. They are standing in your place. A non-subrogation agreement means you can't play that game. That's good because myself and all my engineers, I don't want my insurance company and their insurance companies fighting forever over who's error and omission, mistake, cost us money in a job. So we sign non-subrogation agreements within our consultants. Um, I'm not sure what constructors do. Non-subrogation agreements or just contractors' risk policies that cover everybody. But anyway, that's what subrogation is. Uh, it's an important little paragraph to look for in your contracts. The other important little paragraph to look for in contracts is the indemnification clause, which sometimes we can't do much about. Okay, so what did not work? Field supers were uncomfortable with this new process in meetings, the constructor supervisors. Um, the constructors were not patient enough to deal with the iterative nature of design. Um, I'll stop there for a second. One of the things that constructors, we're all good at different things. 
One of the things that constructors have a habit of not being good at is taking something through nine steps, oh, that's not going to work. Whoosh. Taking it through eight steps, ah, that's not going to work. Taking it through two steps, I've almost got it. That's not going to work. One step, got it. Boom, let's do that one. They tend to be people that just want it. They want to build it. You know, my architects and my, myself, we really want to draw it. We want to figure it out in our head, get it on paper. That's fun for us. That's, you know, we want to do that. I'm a spec writer half the time, although right now I'm not, which is great. But I'm an 8.5 by 11 verbal person. As you can tell, I'm kind of quiet and shy. But architects as a group are very visual people. They don't like to read stuff. They want to visualize it. They want to paint it, draw it, render it. They want to deal with visual. So trying to force them to want to like and love specifications is silly. Why should I try to make them forced to do something that their brains are not plugged in to do? They don't want to do it. They look at the world differently. Likewise, constructors want to take hammers, get their feet dirty in the mud with the hammer and their boots and do it and walk away with it and they're saying, I built that. And that's a good feeling. And I want them to do what they're really good at. I want them to enjoy what they're doing. And I want the architects to enjoy what they're doing. So that didn't work. And don't manage risk by narrowing roles and responsibilities. This was kind of interesting. It was a lady architect, female architect, who said, don't, don't bundle all the profits separately from the costs, which I think I deal with in the next slide. Maybe I don't. Yeah, I'll talk about it here. So what was happening was that one of the elevator speeches for a previous paper, I start out with, there are three things in the world. There is love, there is money, and there is risk. If you boil everything down, boil absolutely everything down, it's love, money, or risk. We're not talking about love. It's money or risk. No risk, no money. That's the equation. No risk, no money. Architects have been limiting our risk for forever, and we don't get any money. Who has the most risk on the job? The owner, tons of risk. The contractor funnels those millions of dollars that the owner got through their books and out to a huge pile of subs, tons of risk. The architect's risk is limited to our professional liability from errors and omissions, which comparatively is diddle when it comes to risk. So who has the votes when it comes to the profit picture when you're in the integrated project delivery meeting? Who has the votes? The owner, because it's their money that funded the job, and the general contractor who's spending a bazillion dollars getting it built. If we say, but I don't like it, it really doesn't fit with what we were trying to do for this building, and it's not a structural problem, it's still going to stand up and not leak. If it's still going to stand up and not leak, my votes get discounted a lot. And this, this lady architect was saying, don't tie my profit so closely to the team's profit, because I have so little profit in the team, the major team players, that I get overridden a lot, which I thought was a telling tale. I think integrated project delivery also excludes the trade subs. We talked about, you know, hard bidding the flooring people. That's fine, but my favorite example is large format tiles. I'm working a job right now, we're going to have three foot by three foot tiles. Well, it's a huge lobby. It goes on for three times the length of this building. So three foot by three foot tiles are absolutely appropriate to that. On a PT slab. Now, we have a little topping slab over it. But so far, they've only given me an inch or something for the setting bed. The concrete has to be really flat for three foot by three foot tiles to work without a huge bed underneath it. You can have that conversation between your tile person or your flooring person and your concrete person. But if your concrete people are in-house, and a lot of GCs have their concrete people in-house, and the flooring sub has been hard bid, and you're pushing down on them, they're not going to have that mortar bed in their, in their estimate. They're going to exclude it. We're gonna, tile laid down, 12 bucks a square foot. We're done. Oh, you want a mortar bed. Well, you know that mortar bed, because of the fancy chemicals and how big the tiles are, is as moisture sensitive as carpet is. So now the concrete has to be dry. And I know that general contractors don't really have to pay attention to physics. I know architects don't pay attention to physics. Concrete takes a certain amount of time to dry up. It's what it does. All that water of convenience. That floor is not going to be ready for that flooring. I can guarantee it. 
when it's time to put the flooring down. So now the bed or the leveling material, one of the uh, two, is six bucks a square foot. The moisture mitigation material is another six bucks a square foot. I just doubled your flooring price per square foot because you didn't have your concrete people talk to your tile people because they were in-house and you low bid them. Okay, not good. So lost opportunities, 15 minutes, we're doing okay. So here's a little picture that came from these folks about this beautiful effort curve. We've all seen it a billion times at every AutoCAD, at every Autodesk presentation, but they never show the trade subs. They're in lavender. I know that that's lavender because as an architect, I understand these things. <laughs> it's lavender over there. We don't wear color, but we know a lot about color. Okay, but they're, see, they're not under the curve. And you see when they get started, there's a little hump in the green. That's because they've raised their hands and they said, dude, yo, that stuff is not gonna go down on that floor. You either have to change the detail or change my, my scope. Whoops, says us, and we redo the detail. We've gotta pull the trade subs back under the, under the, uh, under the curve. So, they're not excluded. Their information isn't brought onto the project. That, remember that number of products thing we talked about? Who has the most knowledge about the products? The most intimate knowledge about the products, the trade sub does. Um, I, will, I have had on several occasions a trade sub ask if they could use air barrier or water resistant barrier product B instead of A. 99% of the time I haven't cared, sure. Why do you want to change? And we're going to exclude for the moment distributor deals and the rest of it. I just got my crew trained up on this stuff. I know what the open time is on the sprayed product. I know which nozzle to use. The airless sprayers are set up for it. We know how fast we have to clean them. The crews, they're all, they're ready to go. If I move to another product, which might be a perfectly fine product, what nozzle to use in the airless sprayer? Or is it a peel and stick? And how do we, you know, shink, and, I gotta retrain the crew to do this to that because there are 130 products out there and every architect wants a different product. So the trade sub can't win for losing with, why can't I just use a good vapor permeable air barrier? And my answer is you can, I'd like to see it first before you put it on the building and then give me the substitution request. You know, but it's probably gonna be okay because we're not jerks. We want the job to get done too and if the product's rational, I'm good with that. So let's get the trade subs underneath the angle. Art fabrication sections. So these, some of these things are also things that deal with us in Revit land. Blackened steel, polished concrete. These are things done by craftspeople. There are men and women who spend time figuring out how to make it work. This is not a generic product that I can specify by saying ASTM 63509 whatever, 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 blackened steel. It's like, no, black and steel is bluing, to start with. It's, uh, where is it? it is phosphoric acid with selenium in it to make black rust, very special black rust. But then you have to, you know, and it goes on for half an hour of conversation. The gun people know how it works, and some of the big manufacturing people know how it works, and there are some artisans that know how it works. How do I specify that product? I can say, go get it from that fabricator. Well, it's hard to get a competitive bid that way. Okay, third thing is there is stuff that isn't modeled, and all you folks know that. The 2D details, we don't model to that level in our model. Um, you know, the big, and then, and who picks up the, who, who picks up this? I'm not sure whether I think, I think I have, maybe I reworded this, but the contractor, the general contractor, general constructor, is liable to pick up the money for some of that conflict change because it's big dollars. So right now, the general is usually pretty accommodating when it comes to getting them and their subs to modify the model uh, to make it happen. But how long are they gonna be willing to pay that bill as we go forward? And what do we do about the smaller trade subs? We generally don't model their stuff at all. It's not in, in, in the Revit model. So thank goodness we've got Bluebeam. I mean, you look at the drawings and we can link one drawing to another with Bluebeam, we can get to there. But it's not in the model. Okay. So another, another thing, 10 minutes, we're doing okay. 
why does the specifier work for the architect? Which at, you know, 40 to 400 hours, I was on a job, I'm on a job right now, and the project manager said, this is just an estimate, but I've put in 40 hours for you. 40 hours with the number of specification sections that I had not already written, I had already written a rough draft of all the interior sections, was about 20 minutes per section. That's enough time for me to open up the Word document, read it once, print it to PDF, and close it. Not do any work at all. But yet, how many thousands of hours are we building to drafting? Now, I love to draw. I'm really having fun learning Revit because I hate it so much. I'm going to learn how this program works. Then I can hate it with knowledge, which is always more fun to hate with knowledge than just to hate it. Um, so what do you think my wife, the attorney, actually now she's a judge, she sat down with one of my specs one day and she's flipping through it. She goes, this, so is this one of your specs? I said, yeah. She goes, well, I could litigate this. <laughs> Thanks, hon. <laughs> Lawyers are, are, are like me. They're eight and a half by 11 verbal people. They look at the drawings, but they'll spend a day in the specifications. And yet, you guys want to take the specs and trim it down to how many hours? But you're going to spend how many times drawing stuff? Now, granted, I don't go through the same iterative process that we do when we're drawing. But still, we should be thinking about how much liability is embodied in the specs and what we're doing with it. Well, the short answer is, and I've kind of talked about some of this, is right now, the specifier works to essentially limit the liability of the architect. I am not there to make the world a better place for the owner. I mean, in general, yes, I am. But I am there to document products and installation in such a way that my architects backside is covered. That's my job, because I work for the architect. So first and foremost, I want my job to be safe. The owner comes second. If I was independent, or if I were independent, um, I might be working for the owner's best interest. I might be building that spec purely for the owner, because I'm contracted directly with the owner. That would change my relationship to the owner and change but it change how much I'm going to get paid, because I could, to start with, I have a lot more value, um, which comes, and I'll say, how would I end up with more value, Mark? How can you show the owner more value? By showing them some data. We could go look through piles and piles of lawsuits, look for the stuff that didn't work, that got sued on, made sure that that was specified as closely as possible, and make sure that my documents do that, so I can show value to the owner. Value and, and uh, I don't get into it too much, but there's lots of things that specifiers could do. I noticed I had said database in there. There's a lot of things specifiers could do that don't serve, the, that really not there, there for the owner. I could build, it's hard for me to do in my current program, but with a little bit of tweaking, and my friend Beth Strochain is doing this, I could print out a list of all of the mock-ups, all of the product information submittals, the verification color submittals, the, all the different types of submittals, right? mock-ups, uh, field testing, any sections of the field testing, any ASTMs being used. I can slice and dice the information in the specification database any way I want to. Most of that does no good whatsoever for the architect. But David, would you love to have all that stuff in stacks of little reports because I have a database to manipulate? It services the contractor, and in the end, it services the project, but it doesn't service the architect. There's no money in me for doing that. Likely, there's quite like, there's no money in the architect doing clash detection. It doesn't pay us to do clash detection. It pays the, the general constructor instant money. Any piece of duct work that doesn't have to go back to the shop and get refabricated, or worse yet, just thrown away and having a new one do done, is worth two 27-year-olds, a rack of Rockstar energy drink, and a box of Oreos. I mean. That's what you pay 27-year-olds, isn't it? But I mean, you know, it's instant money in the contractor's pocket for doing that clash detection, but it's no money for us. Why am I building a Revit model at all? Because the contractors, you guys throw our models away anyway. Not that they're bad, but they're built for different purposes. We don't treat curtain wall the same way you folks treat curtain wall in contracting land. It's not what you do. We're, build, we're building it for different reasons. Okay. Solutions. 
I'm going to motivate along here. So what are the constructors doing? As I just talked about, I anticipated myself. You're building your model because you're using it for different reasons. We're not bad, we're just different. And then you guys absorbing the costs, so I anticipated myself. Um, it's about information. We do have to coordinate actively, and we have to trust each other. We really, truly, truly have to trust each other, like never before, if we're going to improve productivity. That's hard to do because it's hard to get businesses, businesses, to trust each other. Because business, that's not the nature of business, to trust each other. The nature of business is to protect your business. Cooperate as you need to to get things done. Uh-oh, I did something radical. Remind me later. I just worked a Mac. OK, so how can we get to altruism? So let's get going here. Engage, so again, we've talked about bringing the small consultants in. And the small consultants shouldn't freak out. I won't show the rest of the slide, but you, professional liability does not require a stamp. Professional liability requires what everybody in this room has, a specialized body of knowledge, right? that you have that other people rely upon. If they rely upon that special knowledge you have and you're wrong and they're damaged, you should have professional liability insurance if you're a one-person shop. I relied upon their special knowledge and it failed me. I have been damaged. Rely, damage are important words. And they can, you can get sued. You don't have to have a stamp to need professional liability insurance. And errors and omission insurance is a subcategory of professional liability insurance. Even small trade subs, that blackening steel person or the polished concrete person, they can get professional liability insurance. And it won't, actually won't cost very much either. OK, architect's folly. So we're going to talk about architect's follies. What is a folly? Come on, somebody who took architecture history. Come on, people. I'm going to send you all back to architecture history class. And a folly is a small structure that has no real purpose it just kind of looks cute, and there it is, and isn't it lovely? I want one as well. The wife really wants one. She saw a couple of these pictures this weekend. So first of all, if architects don't get on the stick in being collaborative and being part of this team, the contractor is simply going to do it. Quite frankly, oh, I'd love to get into this for another half an hour, but I can't. In the 1700s, architects were rock stars. We were the coolest thing on the planet. All that positivism the beginning of the Enlightenment, it peaks with architecture as a way of engaging all that positivistic thought into doing something. And we could actually measure stuff enough and use math, because math was no longer strictly magic. Newton had happened. You know, we could do some serious stuff with math and buildings. We were rock stars. We are no longer rock stars. We are a team member. We had better get used to that. We could talk about big data, but I'm not going to except for the construction industry, as in 2009, had 51 petabytes of data via somebody's measure, 966 petabytes in manufacturing, and 848 in government. We don't collect any data at all for anything. OK, so here's a guy who collected some data. William White, the social life of small urban spaces, the reason I got into architecture. He took time-lapse photography, and then he plotted all these little dots by hand on a little sketchy. And here's a couple of pe people, where do people stop to have conversations? At the corner, where all the other people are. Here's two guys in 1974, sideburns, the suits, talking about golf swings. I can do that now with a bunch of GoPro cameras, and the computer can analyze where people stop. I can have the computer do all this work instead of doing it by hand. We have got to start collecting data. OK, we need to gather and analyze data. Both the contractors, the constructors, and architects can do that. And we're not doing any of it. The constructors are gathering a little bit of data, and mostly it's being held by the estimators and not shared, <laughs> even with the team. But if, if the constructors out there, if you guys had RFIDs on all your big equipment and most of your small equipment, where was it being used? How long was it being used? Where are people on your job site tracking people on the job site? All the stuff we do in they do in manufacturing when it comes to organizing people and equipment and that kind of stuff. Sure, every building is different, but cast and place concrete is cast and place concrete. There's going to be some form. There's going to be a hole dug. There's going to be some form work. You're going to put it together. You're going to pour it. You're going to strip the forms. You're going to move to the next thing. How is that process being done? 
are we thinking about it at all? And we're not, because we're not gathering any data, and we're not analyzing that data, and we're not sharing that data. Here's another folly. I love this, the dark side of data. The little quote at the bottom, I'll let you guys read it. It looks really cute. It was kind of iffy. We're going to have to realize that data can be bad. If I analyze all the RFIs in my office for a job, which I really want to do, I may find out that we have one detail we use over and over again. It's just tragic. And we need to get rid of it and use a better detail. Likewise, I can also find a detail that is absolutely correct. There is nothing wrong with that detail. But on every job, the contractor or the constructor rings up and says, I don't understand this detail. What are you talking about? Not that the detail is wrong, but it's not serving its purpose in communicating with the contractor. So I still need to fix it. But we don't do that. I don't know any architecture firm that does that. OK. The golden future. I think, so I am almost done. It's just 102, so we're doing pretty well. We really need to encompass the whole team. Lean, I'm not going to talk about lean. Lean is something that manufacturing has been doing for a while. Because, and how did that happen? The US had a set manufacturing industry. It was pretty well established. We destroyed Japan's in the war. And so we sent our industrial folks, manufacturing folks, over to Japan. I can't remember the guy's name. It starts with a D. And he started telling the Japanese folks, here's how to put your manufacturing stuff together. And it was all about lean. The Japanese put nice Japanese adjectives and adverbs to it and improved upon it. And now they're selling it back to us. But lean is a good thing. If manufacturing uses it, why aren't we using it at all? We sell it to all of our hospital and healthcare clients, but we don't do it. We don't study our own processes. The constructors don't study their processes. So whew, my conclusion, get the trade subs in the picture. I suggested to one of our architects, they wanted to sell an owner on a concrete building. I think we should take the concrete sub with us and hire, have the owner hire the concrete sub directly. The general contractor can come later. I want Conco or one of the concrete companies in town to be working with my designer sorting out how best to put that concrete together, the formwork, the mix, you know, all the things that make good concrete. Because concrete is an art. It's not just cooking, the, cooking it and you're done how to best put that together to work for the job. Then hire the general, because they are scheduling experts. They're estimate aggregators. And they're not specialists, just like I'm not a specialist. OK. Thank you. I'm five minutes over, four minutes over. I really appreciate it. I hope I was not boring. Um, thanks. <laughs>